Welcome everyone. This is Making a Life oh. Conversation number two. Um, okay. I need everybody to mute themselves. We keep on putting it on mute all, but somehow you're coming, coming unmuted. So if you look at the bottom left of your screen, there's a little microphone and if there should be a cross in it. So try to keep an eye on that because we're not exactly sure how that becomes unmuted, but we want to keep tabs on it. So if you haven't already told us where you're from in the chat, I hope that you will do that. And if you feel inclined, tell us a project that, that you are working on. We're gonna, um, this is gonna be a 45 minute conversation between Jeanette and me, and then there's gonna be 15 minutes of Q&A afterwards. Um, because you're all muted, the way to ask us questions is to actually go to the uh, chat section and the first person to come up should be ask a question. It's underscore ask a question. I'm looking on mine, it's the third person for some reason, but ask a question is uh, our co-worker, Christina, or an MDK worker, Christina. And uh, she will be gathering the questions and then she will be passing them on to Kay Gardner. Kay is the co-founder of Modern Daily Knitting with Ann Shane, and Kay is here with us today. Um, and I'm going to pass this off to Kay so she can introduce herself and tell us a little bit about Modern Daily Knitting. She is, um, I'm so thankful to her for agreeing to be our partner in this. I do two things. Um, I am the editor and creative director of the MDK Field Guides, and in that way, I work with Kay and Ann, and now with Jeanette. And then I have my other work, which includes writing um, the book, Making a Life, Working by Hand, and Discovering the Life You Were Meant to Live. And I started this conversation series as a way to continue to explore the ideas that I um, introduced. Um, I didn't really introduce them, but the ideas that I um, wrote about in that book. Um, and so now my life is sort of merging together with the, my MDK work and my other work as a writer and author um, in one place here today. So, Kay, it's your turn. I'm ready. Um, so I'm Kay Gardner. I'm one half of uh, Modern Daily Knitting. It's um, interesting to me because uh, Modern Daily Knitting started as a conversation, an online conversation between me and Ann Shane dogs years ago, let's just say like 15, or so years ago, we met on a chat board, a Roman chat board, and we started writing to each other. We started blogging. We started writing books together. And, you know, the only thing that has ever really uh, united us is the love of knitting. Um, we had this dream of a, a website that would be more than a blog, but kind of a daily, a daily magazine for knitters. And we've been producing that now for four years. Um, the URL, you can find it in the chat, um, but it's moderndailyknitting.com. And we abbreviate that to MDK because it's faster. Um, but in addition to that, we work with Melanie to produce field guides. And um, Melanie's kind of amazing because she does that while writing her own book. Um, and I'm really here today just to kind of, um, the Yiddish word is kvel. Um, I'm just, I've got Melanie, I've got Jeanette, um, Anne and I could never have dreamed that we would be uh, working with both of these people at all, let alone at the same time. So um, I'm just, you know, going to watch the conversation just like I watched them work together uh, to make uh, this field guide number 15. It's our brand new field guide uh, with designs by Jeanette. Um, and I'm really here as a bookseller today. Um, so you can go to moderndailyknitting.com. We have a shop and we have the field guide and we also have Melanie's beautiful book, um, which is uh, not with me right now. My copy is not here, but um, it's uh, an incredible book. And uh, for as long as we can, 
we'll be sending out with each copy of Making a Life a card that Melanie made. So that's really all I have to say. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I'm going to mute myself, which is really hard for me to do because I like to talk. Uh, but I'm really excited. So take it away, Melanie and Jeanette. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kay. Ali, can you fix the spotlight? I think we have. Yeah. Um, all right. So first thing I want to do is welcome Jeanette. Um, Jeanette is a knitwear designer of long, long, long standing. And as we evolve in the conversation, we're going to go over what her upbringing was like, what her um, education was like, and how she got to the point where she is today. And then we'll segue into sort of the meaning of making by hand in her life and then to the actual field guide that um, we work together on for modern daily knitting. So one of the points that I make in my book, and since Kay did not have a copy of it, I will, in case you haven't seen it, this is making a life, which I guess is backwards on your screen right now. In any case, one of the points that I make right in the beginning is that making by hand goes back to the beginning of human history. Human beings have always made by hand for tens of thousands of years, we made by hand to assure our survival. And it's only since the Industrial Revolution that people stopped using their hands as part of daily life and um, started to rely on machines and then on computers. Um, I'm going to segue into talking to Jeanette right now and about her experience because her parents are actually in their 90s. So they come from a different generation, a generation when although everything wasn't made by hand, a lot of things were. So um, I wanna to talk to her about her parents and their upbringing. So Jeanette, to start, can you just tell us where you are right now, where you are in England and where you are in your home? And then tell us a little bit about your parents and their journey from Barbados to England and make, what making by hand or what making was like for them and in your household. Hi Melanie and hi everybody. Um, I'm really nervous. It's incredibly hot here. So I am. Um, I live in a town called Hove. You probably know um, it's partners part of partner city Brighton much better, but it's Brighton and Hove. It's right on the south coast of England. Um, Brighton's very famous for its pier, um, and the sea is three minutes in that direction. And I'm in my little office in my house, um, and um, my parents came over to the UK from Barbados um, at the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s. So they were part of the Windrush generation. Um, and they were, although they didn't make as a profession, they were really, there was a real culture of making in my family. So my dad used to make shoes for my mum. She told me he used to get the catalogues from the States and then copy the styles and make shoes for her. Um, and mum used to sew, she used to tat, she used to crochet, um, and she learnt to knit when she came over to the UK. She was taught to knit by my um, godmother, Winnie, um, because she wanted to learn how to make the sort of styles that she wanted to wear. She wanted to, to she needed to learn how to make knitwear because it was cold, obviously, coming from Barbados to the UK, um, but she wanted to be able to sort of freestyle and, and I suppose put her own design stamp on what she was doing. Um, so she did that when we were kids um, and she knitted and sewed for us throughout our childhood. My dad didn't make shoes when he came to this country, but he was very, very, uh, a very practical man. So he used to, oh, excuse me, he used to make furniture. He um, put in our central heating in the seventies where you couldn't just call somebody up and get it done. Um, he would turn his hand to pretty much any, anything. So they were very, very hands-on and very practically minded. Yeah, I was thinking about something related to that, that there's a certain safe feeling as a child. I think there's a, for a certain feeling of safety and security, knowing that your parents can, can fix things, can make things. And, um, you know, I've often said that when I don't know how to do basic repairs in my own home, I actually feel a bit like 
I have my hands tied behind my back. And it's almost like over time, our hands, rather than being sort of in front of us and ready to be used, have sort of moved outside of our, our being and or maybe behind our screens and on our, onto our keyboards and we've become sort of less able. And emotionally, I think that gives a feeling of insecurity. Does, do you relate to that at all, Jeanette? Absolutely. There is, there is a comfort in knowing that if, if something needs doing, you can literally put your hands on something and sort of have an influence on getting that, that solution, finding a solution to a problem. Sometimes, it's yeah. more, you know, I suppose it depends on what it is that you're doing. So if it's something like electricity, I probably wouldn't turn my hand to it. But if it was trying to mend something that was, you know, broken or split, then I would, I would look to fixing it first rather than throwing it away, which we're, so, we're encouraged to do so much more these days. Yeah. So you've told me a couple of times that you're very much like your mother. And uh, I know that um, she studied to be a nurse in England, and she yes. told you recently that her favorite or one of her favorite things was doing the drawings that she needed to do as part of her, her studies. And prior to that, you told, when you talking about your childhood, you said that it was your brother that really inspired you to draw and to be creative because he was a great drawer. But in actuality, it's like that passed by way of your mother. And I know that um, she taught you to knit at a very young age. How old were you? So I was seven when I learned to knit. Um, yeah, the, the finding out that my mum used to draw was literally only the last kind of month or so. Mm -hmm. My mum's quite a closed book when it comes to things like that. But she, she said she used to love doing the illustrations in her um, studies when she was studying to be a nurse in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, but she taught me, she was a really fantastic, talented knitter, really very graceful in the way she held her needles as well. As well. Not a, um, a skill that I inherited from her. My knitting kind of looks a little bit awkward, but it gets the job done. And do you have a project there that she made? I, we were talking about that the other day. Yeah, so although she knitted a lot of things for us as kids, I didn't keep anything which I really could kick myself over now. But I did keep this dress that she knitted. And apparently she either knitted this when she was pregnant with my brother, who taught me to draw, or um, she used to wear it when she was pregnant with my brother. So this is a really hefty, iron weight, as you know, it's double knitting weight dress, and it's big. I mean, you can tell it's kind of 60s because it's by the kind of turtleneck, but it is just absolutely beautifully knitted. She loved knitting cables and texture. She wasn't big for doing a lot of colour work, and I never saw her knit anything in legs, but she loved knitting cables. And I remember seeing her wear this when I was, when I was a child. So I managed to hold on to it and my sister's watching this and she's probably going to kill me because I don't think she knows I've got it. <laughs> oh. And do you remember her working on it? This video? No, no. So my brother is, um, he was born in 61. So this was a finished object by the time I came along in 68. It's amazing to think that she studied to be a nurse. She raised four children. She worked as a nurse and she had time to knit a cable dress at that yeah. gate. Yeah. Knit, cook, sew, everything. I don't know how she did it. Yeah. And so have you been pretty much knitting since you were seven years old? So 40 or so years? Yeah, I have. Um, yeah, it's always something that's been with me. Um, I, I, you know, I kind of, I didn't think I'd end up doing it as a job. I, I can certainly admit that I, I didn't, at the time it didn't, it didn't factor that they, it, it was something that you could have done as a job. It was just something that I aspired to do because my mum did it. And I loved the feeling of being able to make something with my hands. Although when I initially started knitting, I would get really frustrated because the stocking stitch obviously curls under and a seven year old, that used to drive me absolutely nuts. But yeah. you know, I stuck with it and I, I love doing it. It's kind of amazing if we look back at our childhoods, often there are so many signs, you know, we of what we were kind of meant to do. And it seems like we're often looking outside of ourselves for answers and yet, the answers are typically within us. And I mean, you told me when we were talking on the phone um, in the last week or so, you know, you've had such vivid memories of making a dollhouse um, yourself using cardboard. And, and you also talked about this pack of felt tip markers that you got. And you talked about like the being like the really big pack, like it was very long and it was all the different colors of markers. And, 
I immediately could relate, and I imagine a lot of people that are listening can relate to that, that idea of those markers. And, and it's kind of how we feel as knitters now when we um, have, you know, access to all different colors of yarn, you know, just that feeling like, oh my gosh, there's so much potential. But just quickly, because I, I really love the dollhouse story, um, if you could just tell us a little bit about the care you took with the, that dollhouse and the detail. I don't know why in particular I decided that I was going to make a doll's house out of cardboard and it was just rough old corrugated cardboard but I do remember that I'd made, it was almost like a, um, like sort of a pran, a sort of an aerial view. I made this doll's house but rather than opening it from the front I actually looked down on it so you could, it was like a plan and you could look into all of the rooms and I cut all the doorways out and um, I remember making a cooker and making a saucepan um, it's not an easy thing to do to make a circular saucepan out of corrugated cardboard and I remember it was not big. It must have been about the size of a two pence piece, but it was really fiddly and using a lot of sellotape. And then putting um, rice in it, because obviously being West Indian, we get a lot of rice. Every other day we get rice. So, um, you know, this kind of like rice grains inside this cardboard circular um, saucepan on top of a cardboard stove that had um, all the knobs and everything drawn on in Byra. Right. Yeah, Let's just interrupt for a second because we have some people behind the scenes that are trying to keep everyone muted, but I, I'm in my side view, I'm seeing in the chat that there's a problem. So Christina or Allie or Kay or can somebody just keep, I don't know what's happening, but if everybody can just work really hard on staying muted, that would help. Okay. Now back to our regular programming. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> So, but by the time you were ready to pursue your sort of higher education, you knew you wanted to do something creative, even though you would never imagined in the beginning that it would be knitting. And, and you said you did a two year foundation course in art and design, which mm -hmm. just sounds lovely. And so for people in the US, it's my understanding that sort of the British equivalent of sort of the end of high school, or you do a foundation course. And I guess, Jeanette, you were telling me that in England then everybody did this foundation and you did it in art and design and then you decided to um, specialize in textiles mm -hmm. and then you studied machine and hand knitting um, and then ultimately got a master's degree in knitwear yeah. and then you've held a lot of jobs and if you can just without going into too much detail about each of them but just to give us an overview of the different jobs that you've done um, within the kind of fiber world? So I started, um, initially I did a, a two year foundation and then I did a two year um, diploma. Um, and at the time though I had an episode of illness which meant that I um, I wanted to, I just got a job because I, I had finished um, treatment. So I needed to be kind of close to home and I ended up getting a job in, a, in, a, in an education establishment. So I was a technician for nine years working on a degree course. So that was basically just kind of helping students um, translate their ideas into 3D. Um, mm -hmm. But all the, around the same time, I was working freelance um, doing embroidery and knitwear design through an agent. So I, I kind of did both of those jobs at the same time. <laughs> so during term time, I would be a technician. And um, in the summer holidays, when there were no students around, I had all the facilities at my disposal. So I would... Um, do my own kind of um, freelance work then um, and then I went on to do my master's, uh, went up to Scotland, met my husband so I stayed in Scotland and then I ended up working for Rowan as a design consultant so I did that for a couple of years um, and ended up, uh, then moved on to um, owning a yarn store which was I don't know. I can't. Are you no. unmuted now? Yeah. That Good. just muted itself. Yeah, somebody okay. hit mute all, I think, because right. we were having so much trouble, and then now we had to unmute ourselves. So, okay. So, I, I worked in education, and then I went back into education went up to Scotland and met my husband and then stayed and became a Rowan design consultant for a couple of years and then um, ended up um, owning a yarn shop 
um, and that sort of segues into me writing my first books because that, that's how I kind of got the publishing deal was having done a couple of designs for Rowan. Right. And then you were writing for some magazines and then also doing some patterns in mag selling your designs to magazines. Yeah, so yeah, so I, I did a lot of machine knitting for a number of years and I used to produce um, machine knitted accessories under a little label I had called Dup Dup. Um, and then it was, I wasn't hand knitting so much, I was machine knitting mostly and, and adding a little bit of um, hand knitting to that. And then when I started working for Rowan, that's when I, I sort of transitioned into doing mostly or, predom or um, um, hand knitting all the time. Yeah. So I want to, you touched upon the fact that your life has been impacted by illness. And I, and I want to talk about that a little bit, first of all, because so everyone knows you're healthy and doing great and it, it all sounds kind of dramatic when we and you'll see when we go through it but i'm it's really interesting the, the, role the, role the, the, work, the role the work work has played throughout this process so you said that in at university i think it was 1989 you were diagnosed with hodgkin's lymphoma mm -hmm. which you recovered from but and you said to me, and this is a quote, knitting was something that I could literally hold on to when I was going through Hodgkin's. I hated that treatment. Knitting got me through it. Mm -hmm. and, and you also talked to me about the experience you had with your mom and how the two of you would knit together. So can you just talk a little bit about how knitting helped you through and then how through knitting you and your mother were able to sort of create a spark of goodness within that experience? So I got diagnosed in between the first and second years of my course and I made a decision really quite quickly that I would just stay on and finish my course because the alternative I decided at the time was I could just go home and just wait to be treated for cancer. So I just decided that I would stay on and just persevere with my course and try and fit the two things in. I fit the course around the cancer treatments. So that's what I used to do. I used to travel back um, every sort of six weeks and I'd go and stay with my mum and dad and then we'd be travelling to London to Bart's Hospital and I would have my treatment. Um, but it, those days were just, the only thing that got me through those days, having mum with by my side and having something to do because anybody who's been through that kind of intensive hospital treatment knows that you're, it's, there's endless, endless tests and um, you've got to have something to focus on. And actually I had a lot of work to do I had a lot of college work to finish so mom would take her knitting and I would take mine and we would sit on the wards and I would sit and knit and um or embroider and I would pretty much be working up to the point they would come and gather me after my tests and say right okay you're either gonna have chemo today or you're not gonna have chemo today but mom and I would just kind of sit and kind of bond and just chat on a ward because otherwise you just sit and think about cancer all the time and it was just a really lovely distraction and focus something that was really positive um, when actually the, the alternative was to just sit there and think, well, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think we can, but that's obviously, a, you know, one of the most extreme type, types of situations mm -hmm. um, in which one could turn to their knitting. Um, but it is true that our handwork can be so healing. And um, sometimes when people tell me, oh, you know, it's a hobby or, or they, treated, I mean, some people think of hobbies as sort of less important than other things in our lives, like what we do when we can squeeze it in. But I have always seen knitting and other forms of handwork as a lifeline. Mm -hmm. And it seems like in this situation, you know, it was mom and daughter holding on for dear life by way of their knitting needles. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think you're right. I think also, I think a lot of people given the situation we're in at the moment, I think a lot of people will actually discover that what they possibly previously had seen as something that's quite trivial or silly, they've kind of then been gravitated towards to try and get us through what we're going through at the moment with lockdown. Yeah. COVID-19. Absolutely. So you know, the next thing you had another health situation when you were diagnosed with breast cancer um, about 15 years later and um, you obviously have recovered from that. But the one thing you said to me that I thought was interesting was, and I would just wanted you to sort of share with people of what, when they put the line in your arm, like what, what was one of your first thoughts when they put the line in, I guess, for the chemo? 
first thing I thought was, I'm not going to be able to knit with that in my arm, am I? Because they, they, I think it's called, I remember right, it's called a pick line and it goes in, in the crook of your elbow. And sure enough, after about the first two sessions, I um, had spent so much time doing this that I've actually cracked the pick line and it wouldn't, they, it wouldn't viable anymore. So then they had to take it out and they put a Hickman line in instead, which kind of goes down um, into one of your arteries and down at the tip of your heart. And I just remember thinking, I'm really glad you've done that. Because I just said to them, you know, that pick line's not really going to work. But obviously they didn't kind of understand the value that knitting, I placed on knitting and how it was going to get me through. And they ended up changing it in the end anyway. Yeah, yeah. And then finally, and this is the last health scare that um, Jeanette has dealt with, but it's a really, it, it's just part of your life story that then in 2016, you did have a brain tumor. And at the time that it was diagnosed, you didn't know that it was benign, but it was. And, um, but one thing that was, you told me about was, um, you know, with having people like fiddling a lot around in your brain and interestingly doing handwork in your brain <laughs> um, mm. that to, to figure out if you could, what you wanted to figure out if you were actually back to yourself, you thought you needed to see if you could knit. And in particular, you wanted to do lace knitting. Can you tell us more about that? <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it's possibly not the most kind of obvious thing that you you kind of decide that you're going to do after you've had an eight hours of brain surgery but I just having having brain surgery for me and it's, it'll be different for everybody but it was like having my engine room messed about with um and so I just decided that if I was going to regain that sense of self I needed to knit but not just knit any old garter stitch I needed to be able to challenge myself and cope with that challenge so I remember sitting in the hospital about about a week actually after I'd had the operation because they needed to take the staples out. I had about 40 staples in my skull and I sat on the ward knitting lace and I just remember thinking, yeah, okay, it's, it's, you're, you're all right. You can do this. So there is a way, there is a way back. Yeah. And then after all of that, you know, you said that, you know, after the brain surgery, like you really kind of had to reassess how you were leading your life because you, it wasn't just that, you know, you wanted to slow down the way a lot of people want to slow down because they're busy, but that, you know, physically and emotionally, like you just, in order to be well, you really needed to settle in and not have so much stress in your life. Um, and so one of the things you did was create Sloan made, right? Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us about that? So I kind of, I hadn't, after I sort of had, I kind of closed down my little label duct up, I kind of, I didn't make sort of, I didn't um, produce ready-made accessories. So what I was doing is I was focusing on producing hand knitting pattern, not producing finished items. And I just kind of realized you've got a lot of time when you're lying around in hospital and, and also when you're out recuperating. I kind of thought, actually, what I really miss is being, being having that pleasure of just, playing with ideas and then making an item just purely for the pleasure of making something that's beautiful and developing an idea from something that's drawn into something that's three dimensional and without the kind of the pressure of a deadline or any expectation from anybody. So if I make some, then, I, then that's fine. If I don't make any, then that's fine as well. But I, I kind of like the idea of creating something when I wanted to. Um, and then offering it out and, and you know making it available to people. So that's how I came up with the idea of slow me. And also the fact that it kind of sounds like slow. So it was to try to slow me down because I do tend to, I've got a very overactive brain and I do tend to kind of um, buzz around the place. My husband calls me flubber, you know, that film where that, that stuff that just bounces all over the place. He calls me flubber because I'm always doing lots and lots of things. So it was something that was intended to just make me much more intentional and slow down and pace myself at a much more thoughtful measured sustainable pace so that's why I kind of came up with that idea yeah and I think that you know I often say that and um you know that making by hand is a pathway to wellness that I think that as makers if we can take back the narrative about its importance in our lives and we can share what we know with others that we can make the world a better place um and I I truly believe that. And in listening to your story, 
you know, I hope people recognize that, you know, we shouldn't, this idea like that you had, you came to that um, in part after suffering, you know, these health crises, um, this idea that just making the ordinary extraordinary, you know, that this basic human impulse that comes to us from the beginning of time, like that is within us. And if we can listen to that, if we can push away distractions for enough time to listen to our inner voice, it often is to sort of sit still and create something with your hands. Yeah. And um, I just think that that is sort of a beautiful idea that it seems like is hard in our culture to embrace that we have to keep on reminding ourselves and reminding ourselves. And I know when we were talking about your daily routine, you said that you use a, a meditation app to help I was you. Thinking about that, yeah, I was just thinking about that. It's just, and it's not, it's not gobbledygook. It's just, I think we we spend so much time being stimulated by things that we're looking at and stuff we're supposed to be following and likes we're supposed to be gathering that there is a real, it's almost like a snootiness of, of just being sitting down and just looking out of a window. And all of this sort of, it wasn't a revelation after I had my brain surgery, but it, it makes you really reevaluate more than anything else that I've been through. It made me kind of think, do you know what? I need to see things in a very different way and approach things in a very different way. So I do, I've got the Calm app on my phone and it's keeping me sane at the moment. It's just, with everything that's going on at the moment, it is just, a really beautiful 10 minutes in the morning where I just sit and I do it facing the, my, um, the doors to my garden so that when I open my eyes what I see is my garden and it's just it's like 10 minutes where I can just breathe and stop and then that sets me up for the day. And you said you're a new gardener right? Oh yeah <laughs> yeah I think if anybody was watching me they're like what is she doing? <laughs> yeah so I kind of it's, it's funny since the lockdown I have knitted about four rows so since I finished the field guide I've actually done very very little knitting I can't quite work put my finger on why that is I don't know whether it's because I've got a lot of stuff going on um, with looking after my parents so I think I kind of feel a little bit like I'm on edge or on alert and when I knit I like to just feel like I'm you know I can just breathe and relax and just enjoy without worrying about having to get up so I, t I took I took to gardening and um I'm growing tomatoes in the porch of our front the front of our house mm -hmm. and uh they're coming on really really well in fact it's so it's so hot the other night I was down there and I just thought where the hell's that water coming from and it was it was so much moisture in there it was actually dripping off the ceiling in the porch of our of the front of our house it's a rainforest <laughs> yeah it what it was it really really was so yeah so I'm, I'm getting tomatoes I've been growing chard kale carrots which looked really impressive at the top but I took one out of the pot the other day and it was really impressive it's quite wide and it was that long so I don't uh, know I that problem with carrots. <laughs> so Another thing that happened um, recently and sort of post-surgery is um, this new website that you have called mm -hmm. BIPOC and Fiber. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for you to tell us how that came about and then tell us about what it is. Okay, so um, if anybody has been on social media for the last couple of years, they may be aware of a conversation that's long overdue um, that we've been having about the lack of representation of um, BIPOC, that's black, indigenous, and people of color um, in the fiber industry and the fiber community. And that kind of um, ran alongside a conversation about racism in the fiber community. Um, and actually it just seemed like it was a sort of precursor to everything that's happening now, but this started at about two years ago was the big kind of conversation. So around that time, there was a, um, a lot of talk about diversity um, in the fibre community. And I was working for Knitting Magazine, um, which is a UK publication at the time, and I had said to the editor, are you aware of what's going on here? Um, previous to that, I think it was about a year before that, I'd met the artist Lorna Hamilton-Brown, who was um, studying at the Royal College of Art in London. Um, and Lorna describes herself as a knitting evangelist and she's black and she was the only black student on her course and she was writing a dissertation called Black People Don't Knit and discussing um, the lack of um, 
histories and, and representation of black people in knitting because somebody had said to her that black people don't knit. Anyway, cut a long story short, Lorna and I became friends and she started, she made me start to question uh, um, why we didn't see um, non-white people basically in the fibre community. Even though I'd been a, a knitwear designer for over 20 years, I knew that I was you know, um, one of a minority in, the, in, in terms of visibility. So I started kind of asking questions about what, how many black knitwear designers people knew and started getting about loads of answers from people. And I realized then that there were lots of people out there, but we just didn't know who they were. We hadn't seen their work. And it just kind of occurred to me that it would be a good idea, a valuable resource to put together their names. So I started something called the POC Designers and Crafters List. Um, and that, proved to be so, so popular. And then um, that kind of, um, I knew I wanted to kind of develop it into something more, but at the time it was just a list on my blog. Um, and then uh, a, a now friend, Alison Chu, got in contact with me. Um, Alison is um, American, she's Chinese American. Um, and she was up in Edinburgh and um, together with Lorna and um, a couple of other people, Christy Ford and Juliet Bernard, we got together and we created BIPOC and Fiber. Um, so what had started out as a quest to find black knitwear designers actually threw up um, on through all the comments I got on Instagram that there were lots of other non-white um, people with um, non-white heritage and ethnicities that they didn't feel that they were represented either. And so that's why I broadened it. And I just thought, well, there is something here that um, I think we need to kind of, um, publicized really. Yeah, you know, I recently, I don't think probably other people have heard this um, expression or this idea before, but I read it, I think, recently for the first time, or it's the first time I noticed it, and it was the idea that history belongs to those who write it. Mm -hmm. And it really made me think of Lorna's dissertation, which um, you I think it, there's actually a link on your website to it. Yeah, um, yeah, my blog, that's JeanetteSloan.com? My, my blog is JeanetteSloan.wordpress.com. So there's definitely a link to Lorna's um, thesis on my blog. Okay. I, I will put one actually on BIPOC and Viber as well, because I think it's really important that people read it. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, certainly that seems to be what her her, um, a lot of what her dissertation is about is that history belongs to those who write it. And, you know, you, everybody needs to sort of rep be represented. So, and it seems like your site is similar, you know, a site, we don't think about writing a website, but I think it's the same idea. And so, um, when I see, you know, a little while ago, Ali scroll down so people could see the faces on your site and, it almost makes me cry. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> me, me make me cry now. The, the night that we launched that website, my phone just nearly blew up. I couldn't believe it. And I just thought, we, we did it. Actually seeing it, having an idea is one thing, but seeing that and seeing people's reactions to it is absolutely incredible. It's absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. We've got a lot more work to do, um, and, but it is just fantastic. And I still get a kick out of it. Yeah. And so... How, um, how many people are included in, in it right now, are represented? We launched with 100, we've just put another 10 on, but I mean, that's because unfortunately I've got sort of caring commitments that I've meant that I've had to sort of take a little bit of a step back, but we're, we're gonna be back on to it. <laughs> the we've got expert. so many names and it's as long as somebody, as long as somebody is BIPOC and they're working, so it's not, it's not a website for sort of hobbies. It's not like a BIPOC Ravelry. It's not that. It's about putting up links and profiles of people who are working in the industry. So whether, and it doesn't matter what discipline either. So it could be crochet, weaving, um, knitting, um, you know, tapestry, embroidery. As long as they're working with fibre, that's it. And also we're now finding as well, what was interesting is we initially thought, well, it's going to be people, obvious people who are things like designers, makers, um, tech editors, but we've had people contact us and say that actually they're looking for um, BIPOC fiber producers as well. So we're going to be adding new categories to it. And also stylists, yeah. stylists, editors. So people who are kind of associated with the fiber industry and publications. 
Yeah, and that's so exciting. I mean, I feel like as a maker, like just as a citizen, it's so exciting when new voices are heard, when they are brought to the forefront, because I, I just immediately think, oh my gosh, like I want to see their work. And it, it's almost, and I imagine you might feel this way, like, you're just like, why is, did it take this long for yeah, us? Yeah, yeah. And actually part of me thinks, why didn't I say something before? Why? I don't know, because that went through my head. I was just thinking, you know, were you kind of quite complacent and thinking, well, actually, I'm all right. Or, but then that conversation kind of came up and there was a lot of stuff that actually came back, um, that memories that I'd had of stuff that had happened to me. So not necessarily in the fiber community, but outside of the fiber community where I've experienced racism, just thinking, yeah, actually, I remember when that happened to me. And yeah, I remember. And you'd spend so long suppressing stuff like that, that it becomes normal. It's only when other people start talking, you kind of go, yeah, actually, this isn't, this is not normal and it's not right. And you shouldn't, and you, you, there is so much kind of pent up anxiety and tension. So when you start, when you start to re relax and when it starts to dissipate because you're talking to other people who experience the same thing, there's like this kind of collective sort of breath, exhale, where people go, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. So mm -hmm. having, working with you know um the people that i've been working with is absolutely incredible because i really feel like i'm doing something that's really valuable i love what i do as a designer but i think what i'm doing with bipoc and Pyro and with the others is just incredible yeah it's so important so i'm so happy to be doing it and it and it also reminds me you know in that the importance of our handwork and how it becomes when we do what we're passionate about and for somebody else it's maybe it's not handwork it's something else but in this time in our society where communities are not what they used to be in terms of connection you know we seek out people with whom we share an interest and by way of that by getting to know people by way of our knitting or sewing or quilting or ceramics whatever it might be then we learn about other things. And so it's, you know, when you decided that you were gonna study textiles, you couldn't foresee that some of the most important work of your life was gonna be creating, you know, a website called BIPOC and Fiber. Yeah, yeah, and, I, I, you know, I didn't do it by myself either. It's absolutely not, you know, I need to kind of name check Alison and Felicity and Lorna and Juliet it's a lot, you know. Yeah. And it took real, real work and I couldn't have done it without them. But I know I would never have foreseen that I'd have ended up doing this because when I when I wrote that article, Black People Do Knit, I just kind of thought, well, I've been trying to kind of, you know, not get noticed as a textile designer, but I kind of thought, well, do you know what? This is what it is. And, I've, you know, I've, I've enjoyed doing it and I've been ill and I'm not going to get stressed about these things anymore. And I'm going to quieten my life down and mm -hmm. how wrong I was. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I love, you know, I do love doing it. Yeah, so I want to move on to the field guide, which I have a really nice way of sort of segueing into it, which is um, the idea of being open minded and open hearted. And I think that's, you know, what we're all getting in a, a lesson in right now in the discussion about racism and other issues in our culture. And our theme for the field guide, April Field Guide 15, is open. And when we first started working on it, you know, we had decided, I think you met with Kay and Anne um, at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival for the first time, and you guys talked about doing a field guide uh, focused on lace. Yeah. And, um, and then we, we tend to have themes that aren't that um, specific to a technique or anything like that, but to make them more broad. And so we decided to make it open, so there's open work and then being open-hearted and open-minded and all the other types of open that we can be. And um, are you, when I asked you what your most vivid memory of working on the field guide, um, which began in January of 2020 in earnest when you came to New York, yeah. um, and you and Kay spent time with me at my home in Beacon, um, but you said it was me cracking the whip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You look surprised. <laughs> I was like, Melody, you were in the laugh. <laughs> <laughs> right, so Kay, right, so Kay, am I wrong? 
<laughs> it's my life, you know. It was one field guide for you. This is this is our daily relationship. So. But you know what? I needed it. Absolutely needed it. I mean, anybody who knows me knows I'm really, really dippy. And so when we were... No, but started, nothing in life gets in co accomplished without that person who's keeping right. everybody on yeah. track. I want, yeah, I want Melanie to be like, yeah. I want Melanie but, to be my go-to person to be there going, I need this, I need this, I need that. Right. I, I'm so dippy that I thought it came out next year. So yeah. I, um, if it wasn't for you, God knows where we'd be now. <laughs> but I will say to people, when I asked Jeanette the other day what her happiest memory was, she said being together in Beacon. So that was yeah. being in my living room together. So, so it's not all bad. No, it, none of it was bad. It, none of it, and your time was beautiful. It, you gave us a really beautiful day. And, and going out, the moment we left um, New York, we were out on the train, and I was like a child looking out the window going, wow. And then we got to Beacon, and it was freezing. It was, it was a beautiful. I had to pinch myself, actually, sitting in your living room with you and Kay. I was like, this is really happening. <laughs> yeah, so we're sort of... We need to, I don't, I want to talk a little bit about the field guide and then we're going to segue into the questions, but you know, people were promised that we would tell them a little bit about behind the scenes for the field guide. So I don't want to miss that. And when we were together, um, you had the, some swatches and mm -hmm. you sort of talked about mixing and matching and, you know, with our open theme, you know, we wanted people to be open to knitting in different directions and wearing things in different ways. And, can you just tell us a little bit about, about your thought process with that and what that was like for you? So I kind of, I, having, having spoken to Anne and Kay, I knew that it was going to be, um, lace was going to be the technique, um, but I didn't, I know how sometimes lace can make people think, one, it can either make them think sort of heirloom lace and it's going to look very traditional, which is just not the way that um, I do things. Um, but also it kind of kind of fills some people with dread and so I wanted things that didn't that looked more modern and that could be kind of um, played in different ways I wanted to be playful I didn't want it to be a one set way for one particular pattern so I like the idea of playing with yarn weights um, possibly yarn weights you wouldn't associate with lace um, which is another way of taking it away from being um, very traditional um, playing with different colours, so you're scrolling through the aperture shawl now, uh, the stole now, so playing with different colours and different yarns, you've got little bands of texture, different texture kind of grading up um, the actual project. Um, and also the idea that, actually you came up with the idea of um, splitting two stitch patterns into two different projects. So I'd kind of come up with the idea of the shawl and you, you kind of said, oh, we could make this this, take this stitch pattern and make that one project and take the other stitch pattern and make that another project so almost like a sort of lead into then moving on to the shawl so that really is beautiful the way that all tied together because that grew so organically in your living room I really remember that and the, the cardigan was actually based on the a cardigan that I'd bought um, from Muji that I did it was a Muji knitted cardigan in a blue linen yarn and I think you could see it in the slideshow that Kay had um, had on and I nearly didn't get them um, but um, it was just it's a beautiful cardigan that you could wear two one of two ways so it's got the square neckline where you've got the rib around your neck or you could turn it upside down and wear the rib around your waist and you've got like, almost like a waterfall effect around your neck and it, it gives you a much shorter silhouette um, yeah which is a beautiful example of being open-minded, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> about, about how, um, how to do things. And I have to say, like, my favorite part of the creative process is remembering, is that getting together with people and, and sort of planting a seed. You know, there we were on this freezing cold day in January in my living room with these teeny little swatches and and then here we are today or you know talking about this field guide that launched yesterday that we're so proud of and it was just you know it just started as like in our heads like yeah. in your brain where that surgeon was rattling around yeah. and we thank that surgeon for <laughs> keeping yeah. it all intact and so that you can knit lace yeah you can't thank, you, mr. <laughs> thank you mr norris thank you mr norris yeah yeah and um so 
I think um, we should probably with that um, move on to questions. So Kay, have you um, gathered a bunch of them from the chat? Um, you know, we've got way more comments than questions, which I think is a healthy sign of a conversation. Um, so there's some people asking for a knit along. I don't know if you're ready for that, Jeanette, but um, uh -huh. okay. But I, I see Cecilia, our, our mutual friend Cecilia is making the cardigan. While we were talking, I've cast on for the cardigan. I did a provisional cast on on a Zoom call. I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> Um, so, so who was that from? Uh, Cecilia. I don't know her. Sassy. You do know <laughs> her. Stop it. You're going to absolutely kill me. <laughs> Sorry, Cece. She's going to come for us both. She really is. Um, so, and I mean, I think it's very clear from the comments that um, knitting during cancer treatments is, uh, is a thing. And that really resonates with people. Um, and, um, but, uh, well, here's a question. One, and I think, I think I know the answer to this. How does one join BIPOC in fiber? Um, and I, I wonder if, you know, if you could explain sort of what the process is for a person who, who would like to be one of the, in the directory of BIPOC okay. and Fiber. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't cost. So there's on the website, so if you go to bipocandfiber.com, there is a, um, a tab that says join us. If you click that, there's a submission form that you can fill in with just some basic information. So we need um, imagery and um, website links and things. So there was an initial submission form. If you fill that in and send that off to us, then we'll get back to you. So, but please don't expect it to be kind of tomorrow because we've got a lot of, we've got a backlog, a huge backlog. Mm -hmm. But isn't that wonderful that you have a backlog? Yeah, yeah. And the criteria yeah. is that you just need to be in business and working as a professional. Um, and you include bloggers too, right? Yeah, oh yeah, as long as it's fiber related, yes. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm just, excited that it's going to be like it's rich already and if the backlog is very intriguing you know yeah. there's yeah. there's more to come it's going to yeah. open up and reveal itself um and be a living thing you know it will keep it will keep generating and yeah. that's fantastic. and i should say thank you to modern daily knitting for um supporting us because you were one of our supporters so thank you very much for backing our crowd we we loved it when it was just a list on your blog you know because <laughs> we're, we're bloggers we're like well heck yeah she's gonna make a list that's awesome <laughs> it's like so much more yeah it just um, seems like donkeys years ago yeah i mean from our experience we definitely can resonate with the idea that you think you're doing something very simple like you're signing up on blogspot.com and 15 years later it's your it's your full-time job you know and i think that's a little bit of you got a little carried away with bipoc and fiber the way great ideas take you someplace yeah yeah as you did with mdk <laughs> thank you um there is an here's a question um there's some great things i mean I, I would just commend everybody who's in the audience to kind of scroll through the comments because there's some great recommendations of uh books on kind of the the topic that we're talking about which is why you know why do we why is working with our hands healing uh somebody remarks that there's a book called my grandmother's hands which i think i've actually seen that book um uh could you respond to a commenter i'll let the commenter remain anonymous stephanie <laughs> but um do you have a response to the notion of lace being scary woman who has had brain surgery <laughs> yeah, okay uh, see i don't think it i don't think it is but i could get why people would think that it is so um and why don't you think it is like what do you think if i oh, seriously if i can do it anybody can do it anybody can do it so yeah, I don't know if that's so true, but I, I mean, I think that it's, it is one of those techniques that it's so impressive when it's, you know, when you see a piece of it that your, your mind can just sort of go blank with, oh, that must be very difficult. Yeah. And I think in its, in its simplest terms, if you're taking something away, you need to replace it. 
so that you just think like that so you could just do a, a piece of just in fact i'll i was gonna say i'll do a design and i'll give it away but for, i will aim to do that something that's very very simple just knit two together and then a yarn over that's and you just repeat that that's lace that's you yeah. know that's it you know, so, I, I, just, I, I can really relate to this comment, though, because I was, you know, I'm kind of a self-taught knitter, meaning that I, I learned from books more than from people. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing lace, you know, because I wanted to make that thing and it had lace. And I was knitting on it quite a while before the penny dropped about just what you're saying is that every time you add something, you have to take something away. Yeah. Um, you know, the logic of lace kind of... Um, reveals itself to you as you do it and then once you get that you kind of know when you're going wrong you know <laughs> because you yeah. you know uh, and don't you add it and you didn't take away yeah don't be distracted so I probably wouldn't drink if I was doing lace I probably <laughs> wouldn't watch anything that's really you know anything that needs a, a particularly absorbing on television so I wouldn't do that don't do it in the dark I can't knit without looking at it, so I wouldn't do it in the dark. What do you think is the most accessible project in the field guide? You know, I was thinking about that the other day. I think it would be, I think it's probably the rib lace scarf. Because you're not casting on, I love, I love the version that Anne's doing. So I looked at Anne's on Instagram yesterday, and she's, it looked like she had about that much knitted. She got to about, so it's probably about 20, to about 30 centimeters, what's that? I don't know what that is in old money, but anyway. So I would say that it was that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm rambling. But the, no, it's okay. The, I'm just trying to work out. I think it's about a foot. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah let's call it a foot. Um, I think it would be that because it's not that wide and the pattern's only, the repeat's only two rows long. So yeah. I would say it was that because yeah. the other scarf, the tumbling blocks, you've got to contend with having to cast on all those stitches apologies <laughs> yeah and then also but the laces worked on both even and odd numbered rows yeah so that's some, that's some pretty hardcore lace yeah really yeah. i'm but i i'm thinking that um the cardigan is very accessible in terms yeah. of lace knitting because it's yeah. it's just a two row pattern also yeah. really yeah, in, yeah. Uh -huh. in terms of size though the size of project yeah but, yeah. but it is a lot size, of stitches but if you're if you're strong for you know counting your stitches it's a, it's a very small repeat yes in width and in rows so yeah, it's only 16 um, rows long or something okay that it, yeah i think we have to sort of is it time to kind of wrap up yeah, I have one more thing to say with Jeanette, but you want to ask one more question? We'll let this go a few minutes over. And then just so people know, we will officially call this to an end, you know, in about five minutes or so. And then we are, for anyone who wants to, we'll stay on for another 15 minutes for some more casual dialogue. But do you want to ask one more question, Kay? Um, Here, one more question. Well, it, you would be the expert on this, I think, Jeanette. Do you have a go-to type of project for stressful situations? Not lace. No. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't sit in lace when they're about to take the staples out of your head. What would, what, do you know what? Garter stitch. Yeah. If you just want something that's comforting, you don't want to have to bother counting the rows or ca garter stitch. That's always my answer. Slip stitch edges, actually. That's nice. Really yeah. nice. You kind of get like a tube at the edge at the side. That, I would do that. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, Melanie. All right, so I have one quick thing about the way you think, Jeanette, and it occurred to me in terms of people feeling like, I saw a comment like, oh, the lace seems intimidating. And, and I understand that. And, you know, I've experienced that feeling, but I also know that you, know, you can start with a simpler project. But one thing that, you know, if people saw the slideshow at the beginning be before we started, if they came early enough for that, there was that um, photo of your notes that you took while we were um, meeting at my house. And it was so interesting to me, they were so beautiful, but it was mostly drawings of shapes with very few words. And I, I, I thought, oh my gosh, she thinks in shapes. And you know, you since have told me that you have to sort of keep really those kinds of notes in order to remember things. But then it occurred to me in thinking about the projects in the field guide that when you're knitting lace, you're you're 
taking away space in order to make shapes. It is the subtraction of stitches that, and then the addition of them that creates the shapes that create the motif. And that made me think about this whole idea, and you and I have talked about this a little bit, like of self-sufficiency and like reading your knitting, looking at your knitting, not always looking for the instruction for exactly how many stitches and exactly what you're supposed to be doing, but you know, really trusting your own yourself, your mind, and your creativity and your intellect to figure it out. But I did want to ask when you're knitting lace, are you looking at those shapes? No, I think when with all of the project, well, it depends on the project. So with the, the shawl, yes, but with the others, no. It's almost like the, the lace is painting onto the canvas. So the shape is the canvas and the lace is the painting. Whereas with the, the shawl, that's different because, because the shawl is shaped, it's a combination of those two things. So I'm watching that pattern and I'm reading that but I'm watching that grow as well. Right, but when you're reading the pattern, you're reading the shapes, right? Like you're saying like, oh, those go out and those, then the others go in or something? Yeah, I guess, yeah, within, yes, within that, yes, yes. Particularly on the, um, the mood cardigan. So you've kind of got those columns, they kind of, you've got like stacked up four, um, four uh, I think it's eight, eight rows and then it shifts over and then there's eight and then it shifts back again. So yeah, yeah, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah. So just to sort of finish up the main portion of this conversation, I just wanted to mention one other thing. I was actually listening to um, the, pod, the new podcast with Mich Michelle Obama the other day, and she said something um, that I thought was um, interesting. And it was about, she said, the, the recalibration that's happening right now in terms of I think in terms of the recalibration, she was talking about the effect of the lockdown and everything. And she talked about being unburdened by busyness for some of us. And she said, this kind of solitude can be revealing, almost healing. Um, and, I, and, then, and she said something like, people are realizing that leading a simpler life um, with fewer distractions, well, no, actually that's, <laughs> Excuse me, that's in my notes, that was something I thought. But this idea of this recalibration and finding this solitude, when I, when I heard that from her, I thought, oh, she must not be a hand worker, you know, because, and, but it's, I think people are discovering more hand work now because we are at home more, we're not out and about more as much as we used to be. And that that is healing. And you said something to me um, that I, that I wrote down earlier in the week um, about you know everything that you've been through with your career and your life and the illnesses and where you are now and you said this is this is a quote this is the time we get to fill we are not treading water in some, until something else comes along this is it you need to make whatever you're doing count whether that's looking out the window eating your breakfast drawing or knitting and so. Um, I don't know if you want to sort of comment on that idea. And then I, what I wanted to sort of segue into for all of us is to think about something that we've always wanted to do. I often sort of ask my question, this question, if not now, when? So sort of comment on what I quoted back to you that you said to me earlier in the week, and then tell us something that, that you've always wanted to do that maybe, you know, that you need to sort of focus on and do. And then in the chat, if people want to just type out anything that they think of in their own lives, just anything that you have wanted to do. It could be really simple, like make pickles, or for me, it's um, right now, it's learn how to change a flat tire. But, you know, my, my thought here is, this, as you said, this is the time we get to fill. We are not treading water until something else comes along. Like, this is our lives. And Jeanette. You know, something else really resonated with me was, have, you know, you reminded me that I said, because I've got such a bad memory, I say a lot of things and then forget them. But when I was doing my mindfulness this morning, they have like a quote every morning. And if you follow my Instagram, you'll have seen in my stories, that I've, I've put one up and it said, be here now. And that ties into that same idea that, you know, this is what we've got. So 
whatever it is that you think you're putting off until you know a rainy day or what, just get on and do it because you don't know that day may never come and it, you know it, it, you know for a lot of people out there it might not come so what are you what are you waiting for right so what would i do i've got as you know i've got, got a box of really beautiful fabric underneath my desk for a dress that i said i was going to make this summer it's the middle of August, it's boiling hot, and it's still sitting in fabric form underneath my table. So um, it would probably be making that dress. Well, and I'm getting back to my knitting, and knitting again. Knitting yeah. Again. Well, and you know I carry the whip. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to cut it out tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, so um, I want to... Thank everybody for coming and staying with us for this main portion of the programming. Um, if you haven't seen the field guide, the uh, field guide 15 that, for which Jeanette um, made all of the designs, please take a look. You can look at it on the MDK website, and then if you choose, you can purchase it. Um, I should mention that the colors are extraordinary. Um, when I asked Jeanette about her color palette, she was very excited that I was receptive to very bright colors and it was really fun to do that to do that and I know it was great fun for the photographers to do it and they if you look closely at the photography you'll see the kind of communication there is you know I talked to the photographer and the stylist about what we're doing but also they really responded to what Jeanette's pieces look like and um, it's quite beautiful in that way and then um, if you're interested in my other work, you're interested in my book, Making a Life, it's also on the MDK site. And there's also an excerpt if you want to read some of it there. I would love that. Um, and um, so, and then if you want to put in the chat something that you've always wanted to do that you haven't done, and maybe that will help you to focus on that and be present or be people are, people are People are giving great answers, so I'm going to definitely want to look at the chat. Yeah. Some detail. So, um, but, um, so, yeah, I'm not doing my book selling very well, but, you know, come on over to MDK, moderndailyknitting.com, and we have both of these books. Um, the, um, the product listing for Melanie's book, I think, um, does, will give you a sense of, like, what's in store, but... It's such a deep book and it, there's so much of it um, that it's kind of a bedside, you know, almost like a devotional is how I have read the book <laughs> because it focuses on different makers who are all extremely, uh, you know, they're, they're not all people who are um, uh, professionals. Uh, some are, you know, and some aren't. And so it's, it's really much more about being a human who makes than being like, the star of making this type of work. And um, that to me is really a, a very, it's something I need to hear all the time. So, and think about all the time. Yeah, I always feel like I'm most interested in the process. I'm really most interested in the process of what we do and why we do it and less interested in what the outcome is. And I find as I, let go of some of my own perfectionism and I let go of that idea of like racing to the end to have that finished product and I just sort of settle into the process. I've actually been able to be kinder to myself about that process and about the mistakes that happen. And, um, you know, we're all so um, accustomed now to things going really quickly to be able to go on Google and get the answers. Like you don't know how to do something. Oh, I'll Google it. And you know, Jeanette and I have talked about this, and I think I was sort of getting at it and talking about the lace knitting. Um, if you actually sort of surrender to the process and you just look at the work in your hands, I'm not saying don't use Google. I mean, sometimes it's a matter of using Google, but then saying like, I'm going to sit here for as long as it takes. To figure this out and I had it recently learning how to crochet granny squares where I really did need to just say you know what I have to turn everything else off I am committed to this right now so Jeanette can you I did see I didn't peeking through the chat somebody did ask if there's any techniques and I think this could be in knitting or anything else that have kind of intimidated you that maybe you would need to 
commit to the process and be willing to make mistakes and redo it and all of that. I did it with brioche. I'm not a fan of brioche. And I have just I just contributed a, a this a really simple cow to a, a book and it was they said brioche and I was like great. So I had to do that. Um double knitting. Mm -mm. <laughs> no. I, yeah. Probably, it's just mm -mm. So that would probably be the thing that would, for, for somebody who's really anxious about lace, double knitting would probably be the thing because it just would blow my brain. But, it, you know, I think I would have to sit and just really just sit and focus on that. Is there something that you would actually, not that you're like, no, it's not for me, but something that you think, oh, I've told myself that I can't do this or this yes. is hard, but maybe I could, like maybe I could let go of that negative self-talk. Yes. Is there something that you feel like you'd want to do? It seems like with Brita Brioche, you're like, yeah. Maybe you make shoes. <laughs> oh, God. Do you know, I really wish I had made shoes now. Um, yeah, as I, said, <laughs> as I said to you, I've got feet like Bilbo Baggins. I could have done with really good shoes. So, yeah, make shoes or leather work, actually. Just bags, so not specifically shoes. Working with leather. Would have been you'd like amazing. to do that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if I almost did that. So there's a um, there's a, Ger a German maker who works in just around the corner in Hove, and I got his kind of flyer for some classes. That would yeah, it'd probably be that actually, because I really fancy the idea of doing that. And you can just do a simple workshop where you can just make a little coin purse. Mm -hmm. I would love to do that. Yeah, I I've done a little bit of leather work and I really like it a lot. Um, so. We just have just like one more minute before we're actually officially going to end. So I thought I, when I asked you the question, um, and you might answer it differently today, but um, I asked you when we were talking during the week, like, what would a perfect day, what would a great day look like? And um, I was wondering if you could answer that question again. Because do you remember what you said last time? Yeah. Yeah, and I, if that's still what it would look like. And then, you know, uh, Jeanette's gonna sort of answer that question. And then just so you know, um, after that, we're gonna say officially goodbye. And then we're going to play some music and Allie's gonna run um, some pictures from my book, um, Making a Life. Some of them are from my website and some of them are pictures that were not included in the book. So it's a little bit of a sort of behind the scenes. But um, just to let everyone know, everyone know that we are wrapping up, it's always hard to end things on Zoom, so I'm preparing you. But um, I'd like you, Jeanette, to tell us what a great day would look like for you. And, and then everybody in the audience, it's kind of a good exercise, because sometimes we can make some of that greatness happen. OK, so it would start with my mindfulness. And it would, I would be facing my garden. And I would open my eyes get some really good coffee and sit out in my garden and I would still swatch. I would just spread all my knitting stuff across the table. My husband would be out and tell him that he's here because God bless him, he would just say, you're spreading your stuff all over the place. So I would just cover the table in all of my graph paper and color pencils and stitch dictionaries and I would just sit and play and I would have music on. I would have music on and I would be doing that. And so when we talked about that a couple of days ago, you actually added, which I thought was interesting, and I want to share, that you would actually make it a weekend. Do you yes. remember that? And the first day would just be like all of this exploration and swatching. And then the second day would be you sort of thinking about what you might do with those swatches. Yeah. So work on um, them. And I should clarify for if people don't realize, in Jeanette's case, swatching very often is not opening a stitch dictionary and following the directions as is. It's actually inventing or unventing in sort of the knitterly word, um, new stitch patterns. And that's what she did for much of the field guide. You know, sometimes, I thought it was interesting, you said you, sometimes you found um, lace patterns on Pinterest and then you riffed off of those to create mm -hmm. the effect that you wanted. Um, the other thing that you mentioned about your perfect day is that you said it would be a perfect weekend and that the, what you would start developing on Sunday would perhaps lead to something that you dream of doing, which is writing some more books. Yes, 
Yes, I've got an idea. Yes, yes. yes. And I want you to know that I am here (laughs) for you and to cheer you on. Well, I don't want to say I'll crack the whip, but um, I... I am so excited about that dream of yours and I would love to support you on that. And with that, I want to wish everybody who is here all right, a great day. Thank you so much for coming and um, we'll see you next time. We hope there'll be another conversation next month. Um, you'll hear about that um, through the newsletter. So thank you to Kay, thank you to Jeanette, thank you to Christina and Ali behind the scenes, and thank you to everyone. Who thank thank you everyone, everyone for coming. Bye. See you on the internet. Stay See you, Jeanette. Bye. Love bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Loved it. Bye. Fabulous. Thank you.